welcome everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good day, wherever you are in the world. We're really happy that you could uh, join us to today. My name is Mike Beam. I'm the program uh, director for CIB, and this is our first Meet the Editor series. And so we hope to be introducing our encouraged and recognized journals to uh, CIB and give folks the opportunity to ask questions and engage with uh, editors and uh, get a feel for for what they're thinking from the editor side. Um, so this it's a really great opportunity. Um, to meet and talk with uh, editors. So as authors and as peer reviewers, we, a lot of us work in that sphere. And so hearing from the editor and hearing what they think is gonna be a really, really interesting uh, conversation. And so uh, today we have uh, Dr. Stephen Emmett, uh, Professor Stephen Emmett um, from uh, Building Research and Information. Um, so Stephen, Stephen is an architect. Um, he's worked at the uh, Technical University of Denmark, where he was the Hoffman Chair of Innovation in Building. He also worked at Loughborough University. Uh, he is now the head of department, the head of the uh, architectural and uh, civil engineering department um, since August of 2006 at the University of Bath. He's extensively published in his field over 160 articles, 24 books, and almost three million pounds of um, total research contracts. Um, Professor Emmett um, has a long history with the CIB. He joined W069, the CIB Commission on Architectural Management in 1994 and was joint coordinator of that commission from 2005 to 2011. So he has a long history with the CIB. He's initiated several journals, including the Journal of Architectural Engineering and Architectural Management. And he is now the editor of chief of building research and information. Uh, since 2019 and BR&I actually was born out of CIB and when we were talking with us Stephen about uh, doing this we had a real nice uh, conversation so uh, it's really with great pleasure that we have the editor from BR&I as our first and inaugural uh, editor in this Meet the Editor series so um, I know Stephen has a presentation and then I hope we have a great conversation um, so Stephen, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Okay, well, thank you, Michael, and thank you for the introduction and welcome all. And sort of quite a few familiar names coming down along the, the side here, and some I haven't seen for, for a while. Um, I've put together quite a short presentation, it's only about 10, 10 slides, um, because the idea is to sort of just raise a few issues that you might want to talk about later. And it's, it's really, um, really about how we engage, how the, the journal engages with CIB, uh, commissions and, and student uh, chapters. So I put the editor's perspective, I mean sometimes you get to see the editor, sometimes it's just a name at the back of the journal, so I think it's sometimes nice to say hi and just see what we're, we're, what we're thinking and what we sort of our expectations to a certain extent. So bear with me, I don't think it last, shouldn't last too long, but I'll try and give you a bit of context and things. Right, so it's a very simple presentation presentation, um, a little bit about the background to the journal. I think most of you know the journal anyway, but just a little bit about that. A little bit about metrics, because it's important to some people more so than others, but depending where you work and, and things. A little bit about scope and rigor. Um, then we really about engagement. And I've put a few questions at the, right at the end for discussion. I think Michael's probably got one lined up just in case it goes a bit quiet. Um, but some, some, some questions I've been thinking about and I'm sure you've, you've all got some questions as well. So building research and information, we call it BRI, uh, short, some people call it BR and I, but BRI is what we tend to use as the acronym. Um, it was launched back in 1973 by, by CIB actually, um, as building research and practice. And if they, the first one of that is on the website, if you go onto our website, you can see that. Um, it's, it's called, a it's delightfully called a magazine when it first launched. So it's sort of a, I think we've, we've changed the terminology a little bit since. Um, it's been building research and information um, for quite a long time now, since 91. We are heading into our 50th volume, so sort of an anniversary for us in 2022. And rather than sort of spend time looking back at what's been done and what's not been done and various things, I thought we'd try and look to the future. And we were talking about, uh, we put a special issue together, the call for that's on the website. 
um, building health and well-being. And I know we're, it's very conscious in our mind at the moment because of the global pandemic and things, but we were talking about this when I first took over before we'd even heard of uh, COVID-19. Um, so that's really, I think there's, there's been quite a bit in the journal over the over sort of nearly 50 years about um, health and well-being in however, however it's dressed up, um, but nothing specific as a special issue. So that's why we wanted to do that. So that calls out. So have a look at that. If it's of interest to you, please, please let me know. I've uh, got quite a bit of interest at the moment. And it's not to say we might not do another special issue or do something, perhaps we could do something with one of the CIB commissions or something as well. So it's, uh, you know, the doors, the doors still open. Uh, for, for 2022. The publisher is Taylor and Francis, a part of the Informer group. Uh, they have quite a portfolio of, of journals. Um, we are CIB recognised journal status um, and sort of Don and Michael have, have sort of been in contact to say, well, you know, what, how should that look and what do we do? So this is part of that discussion, really. And the website's there, I'll put on there just in case you want to have a look at that. We had, um, I started on 1st of January, I put together a new editorial board, a uh, completely new editorial board. We sort of addressed, um, people who know me are quite, I'm quite keen on uh, diversity. Um, so we've got quite a diverse board. We've actually got more female members and male members at the moment, which I'm quite proud about. Um, and there's also a new editorial team behind behind the scenes at BRI. So we had a quite a big change around actually in terms of where we are. Uh, but fundamentally it's still the same, it's still the same journal. So some metrics for you. Um, now I, I know it's probably because I'm an architect. I mean, metrics don't really interest me a lot, I have to say. I think it's, it's also about the reputation of the journal and, and what's being published in the journal. But I know metrics do, are very important for a lot of people around the world, uh, depending on your employer and the country and various things. So impact factor is, is really one of the main ones. Our latest one, 2019 impact factor is 3.887. That's been going up year on year. Um, it went up a little bit last year, it went up quite a bit the year before, and it's been going up over the years previous to that. Uh, like anything, things go up, they come down again, so we're probably going to slip a bit at some point. Um, it's going to be up and down a little bit, but it gives you a general idea where we are. So we're above average for the, the sector, um, which I'm, I'm really pleased with that impact factor. Um, we're up a quartile journal, so the two league tables were in a construction and building technology with our competitive journals and building and technology. That's sort of the area we're listed in. We publish eight issues a year, and that's round about, there's, depending on how long they are, it might be six, seven or eight um, articles per, per issue. Um, so that's round about somewhere, round about 60 uh, per annum. Um, and if I don't put this up, I know you're going to ask me, but the acceptance rate is is round about 10 percent. It's probably a bit, it's it's actually about it's officially seven, under 7 percent at the moment, but it settles out round about. It goes up and down a bit, of course, but it's round about, I would think, 10 percent under 10 percent. So it is difficult to get into. And I think that's right and proper for a major journal that it is difficult to to get into. Um, so I'm down on that. So the scope, um, this is on the website, so I'm, uh, you can read this faster than I can talk through it. Um, but we are, we're a holistic and interdisciplinary journal. Um, the research largely is focused on the building. Um, so sometimes papers aren't within scope because they're talking about things that are interesting, but not really focused on the, on the building side of things. So we tend to suggest people go to some of our sister journals or competitive journals sometimes. Um, we're interested in the whole life cycle of buildings, uh, so we sort of use the term circular economy these days, right the way through, uh, all the way through, and sort of sustainability has always been a big driver in, um, in BRI, and that's, I think that's right and proper that it, it should be. Um, so usual thing, like no different than any other journal really, we welcome original research, information papers, evidence-based commentaries, um, but I think what sets us out a little bit is this sort of interrelated nature of the built environment and the holistic approach. Um, so uh, uh, it's, it's difficult to say what, looking at a, an article, what 
falls into that category and what doesn't. Uh, so that's sort of sometimes a bit challenging for us when we're looking at these things, but um, we have, have a bit of an idea what, we, what we're after. Um, and what we, re, we, we refresh the scope, it's, pretty, it's similar to what it was before, but we just made it in a bit more accessible language when I relaunched it. Um, so, and I, I put it under the, I use the P's, which is used before, people use quite a bit, of course, but people, performance, policy, process, and product. Um, so they're the main drivers. And if you go onto the website, they're broken down into various, giving some, some indications of what some of the things we're, we're looking for. Um, so that sort of just gives you a bit of a feel. So I think you're looking at the scope, when I look at the task groups and the, um, and the, the working groups, um, I think we cover quite a lot, quite a lot of those. Um, obviously some more than others, but that's obviously up to, I think that's up to you to decide whether you, you think they are, our journal suitable or whether, you know, one of the other journals is more suitable for your, for your output. So the question, I'm, I'm not looking for an answer now, but I think it's a question I would ask, I would ask of you to think about is how does your CIB activity, how do your plans as a task group or working group uh, fit our scope? And I've, I've, I've actually spent some time going through all of the task groups and all the working groups looking at the, what you plan to do. Um, so, and I think quite a bit of that potentially could, could fit. So that's a, that's a question for you, so the commissions and the student chapters, and it's an issue to discuss at a, at a later date. So you know, any, any queries, concerns, please, please get in touch. We're happy to have that conversation. Um, a little bit about Riga, um, I know there's some names coming up here that I know you review, review for BRI, so you're familiar with what we do. Um, we do, I mean, uh, some journal, a bit of variation in the, in the field a bit actually, but we do do a double blind peer review, which I think is the, the, the best way of doing it. Uh, the auth authors are anonymous, the reviewers are anonymous, so that makes it the double blind review. Um, and we try as best we can not to put any identifying features on the manuscript. And every so often I'll get an email from a reviewer saying, I can't review this because I guess who the authors are and they're so-and-so and so-and-so. And, -so and invariably they're wrong. <laughs> they're, they're guessing correctly. So I think we're doing quite a good job in terms of trying to, trying to keep that as, as, uh, as, as uh, neutral as we, as, as we possibly can and fair as we possibly can. All submissions and communication via the journal uh, submission portal. So it's transparent and traceable. If anybody's complaining that we haven't dealt with something for six months or three months or whatever, we can look and see what's, you know, what's gone wrong. And sometimes it's because somebody's not pressed the right button or something. And sometimes we've, it's very rare we lose things in the system because we can see everything. We comply, I think it's important, we comply with the, the publishers publishing ethics and research integrity. Um, I get training on that from the publisher. I get training on research integrity from my employer um, and it's something I take very seriously. I mean, it's, it's something we, we, we hold very highly. We aim to be proactive and provide timely feedback. Now, if I was doing this uh, probably about a year ago, I would say we will get a decision to you in two or three months somewhere there is typical turnaround time for when you submit a manuscript. Um, I can't say that at the moment because with the with the global pandemic, some things are coming in quickly, some things are taking a lot longer than, than normal. And we're finding that people are agreeing to review, because we're, we're driven by the, by the reviewers, of course. Um, we're finding people are accepting to do reviews and for various reasons, not doing, not doing it. And occasionally I get an email to say they've been ill and, and various things. So it's, um, please bear with us. I think it's true of most journals, actually, we're struggling a little bit at the moment. Um, it looks like it's settling down a little bit, famous last words, but it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a challenge for us. So we're doing the best we can. I try and actively um, try and move things along as best we can. And I say that because I know as an author, I've had, I've had manuscripts going to journals and you don't hear anything for a year or any you know, longer. So uh, we do, I think it's important. We do try and do things as, as quickly as possible, but, you know, not, but not rushing as well, but doing it in a good way. Um, engagement with the CIB, well, the working groups and task groups, the student chapters, um, I think this is really the important bit for today. It's, it's what we would welcome. Um, we like to see state-of-the-art critical reviews. I know it's quite common in CIB to do state-of-the-art reports. Um, they're not necessarily the same thing. It depends how you package it. Um, and I don't 
you know, we don't want to see reports. We want to see sort of, um, you know, good, um, balanced, uh, I'm not saying they're not balanced the reports, but we want to see sort of critical uh, reviews coming in. So they're slightly different, probably slightly different to a, a report you're doing for the commission. Um, and when they're good, they are good. And I, mean, I know some, some journals don't take literature review type things, but we do because I think they're important in, in helping to build that knowledge base and they're useful for the researchers as well, of course. Um, position papers, if you've got a view on something, if you can back it up with some evidence, we'd really like to, to see that. And I had an email recently from somebody saying, um, I've, I've got some work. It's you know challenging a lot of well-known conceptions. Um, I've, other, I've approached a few other journals and they don't, they are not interested in it. What do you think? And I said, great, fantastic. It's really the sort of thing we want to, to see. So if you're asking the difficult questions, that's really nice to see. Whether it will get through the reviewers and that is another matter, but we'll, we'll see what happens as and when it as and when it comes in. So sort of reflective and, and sort of you know balanced um, approaches to things and, and asking the difficult questions we like to see. A regional research, well, you all know what that is, and you can we've probably all got slightly different view as to what that means, but we're welcome, open to original research. Um, and proposals for special issues um, so that they may be linked to uh, the World Building Congress or con Congresses in the future, but the next one, 2022. Uh, they may be linked to one of you, one of the task groups or working groups, uh, conferences or a particular activity that you're trying to trying to do. Um, I've had a discussion with Michael and Don about this on, you know, we, we know and I know some of you, some of the names that are coming up, it, it is difficult to take conference papers and get them to the right standard to get them through to get them through the review process to get them through to a journal um, issue. Um, some fail, some don't get there. Some fail. Some end up with two or three papers ending up in a standard issue instead of a special issue. Um, but I think it's worth doing it. I mean, I've done it in the past. A few have failed, and a few have got through. Um, I've worked with people in the past, and a few have got through, and a few haven't. So I mean, it's you know, it's sort of, um, it's not. All I'm saying is, you know, we like to see this, but it's not an easy, <laughs> it's not an easy, easy route. And the other thing I should say, anything that comes in from uh, from CIB or from any group, we we won't be asking CIB members to review it. We'll send it out to our um, panel of reviewers to try and get a you know an outside view on on your activities. Um, it's not to say they're going to be overly critical, but it's uh, it's good to you know keep to keep it nice and transparent in terms of what's being being done. So engagement with the editor, that's me. Um, it's about working together, really. Uh, people who know me, I think I try and respond as quickly as I can to emails and try and try and help people. I think I've I've written down here. I think of, of an editor is both a facilitator and a, and a gatekeeper uh, of quality. Um, now, as editors, we probably spend a lot of our time being the gatekeeper of quality and the editorial team being ed gatekeepers of quality. Uh, but that facilitation, I think, is, is also very important. Uh, I, you know, like every editor, I want the best papers coming into my journal. So that, and that needs a bit of working with people and some facilitation. Um, and, you know, sometimes we have the chat and there's a lot of work done and people go off and publish somewhere else and, you know, OK, that's that's fine. Uh, but it, I think it works around other editors probably have a similar experience as well. So it, it, it's sort of all part of the mix, which I'm, I'm happy with. Uh, so I'm happy to to discuss ideas and draft manuscripts. If I think it's more suited to construction management and economics or uh, engineering design architecture management, for example, I will tell you and say, you know, go and have a, a chat to, to those editors. Um, so if you're unsure, please send me an email. The more information I get, the better. I'm happy looking at draft papers, even if there's you know, big holes in it and things not finished. It gives me a feel for, for what it's like to be. Uh, thinking about a special issue, then please get in touch. They take quite a while. They need my approval. Then they need the approval of the publisher before we launch them and they take a bit of time to, to come through. So if you don't leave it to the last minute, because it does take a while to, to get through. Um, any questions? There's no such and there's no such thing as a daft question, believe me. So any any questions, please please feel free to uh, to mail me, and that's my email up there, and you can find me on the on the bar site anyway. Uh, what I have started doing, um, I've been running, and they've been quite I think they've been quite well received. Uh, running a how to get published workshop with early career researchers, and that might be of interest to the student chapters here. Um, and the first one I did, I, I I've changed the title a little bit to how not to get published now uh, because we spend quite a bit of time 
talking about manuscripts that have been rejected and why they've been rejected and various things. Um, so that, that's a workshop that deals with some of the myths, you know, I can only get published if I know the editor, rubbish, I can only get published if I, you know, if I, if I work at a really good university, rubbish, you know, it's sort of some of these things we, we deal with and I try and give a few tips for sort of making sure your, your manuscript can get, get past the editors in the first place to get out to review and there's a few often things that people do wrong that um, we try and try and address. So that get, that goes down quite well. I'm happy to do that. Uh, no problem. Just email me and we can set set something up uh, to do that. And obviously, I'm happy to discuss with task groups and working groups uh, whatever your aims and ambitions are. Um, and again, I think some of some of your some of the commissions are a bit more suited to to our journal and some a bit more to some of the other journals. But that's you know, that's 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 fine. No problem. So the final slide, so I'm sort of whisk through this, but um, questions and I'll open it up to discussion and stop sharing my screen in a minute. Um, the question really I have is how do you wish to engage with BRI? And I guess because you've joined this morning, you're thinking you might want to <laughs> engage with BRI um, and you know, in sort of what way. Um, what would you like to submit to the journal and what would you like to ideally see published or try and get published? That is a CIB output. I know a lot of you, you uh, submit journals on your, you know, as a um, under your own name or your name of your colleagues, but uh, we don't see much that comes in as a in inverted commas a CIB output, and I think that's the that's the focus today. And I know as a as a uh, task as a commission um, coordinator for a long time, you know, and, and heavily involved with architectural management for a long time, it's you know it's not easy to do I mean it does take a lot of effort to get there but I think it's worth worth doing it so that's the question for you perhaps for today perhaps for another time I don't know and the other question is what do you need from me um, you've got me for, for a little bit of time uh, now but obviously you can contact me at a, at a future date you've been thinking about things and I'll try and respond but you know it's useful for me to know how we can facilitate that relationship with with the CIB to everybody's benefit really. I mean it suits me to have um, world leading research being published, it suits all our editors to have world leading research published, it suits I guess it suits you to be publishing in the in the top journals of which of which we are. Um, so I think it could be a quite a nice uh, relationship um, in that sense. And that's me done and I shall open up to the uh, uh, the questions and, and discussion. So thank you for your attention this, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, whatever it happens to be. <laughs> Stephen, thank you. That was a very nice presentation. Very nice. Uh, thank you so much. And yeah, we'd love to have some questions from our group and um, we'd love to open it up. If, if there's any comments out there, folks can certainly uh, text chat. We also have uh, you know, the audio uh, capability uh, as well, too. Um, if you could alert us, if you have a question, I could ask a question to maybe okay. get us started, Stephen. Um, so yeah. I'm always interested in, so as a, as a uh, reviewer, um, it's, it's always interesting to me to see some of the quality that comes, you know, from, you know, from the editorial, uh, you know, uh, desk and, um, you know, sometimes I wonder, um, you know, how did how did this one get past the uh, how did this one get past the editor's desk? And so, um, you know, do you, do does BR and I does the editorial team do 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 they reject a lot of articles, a high percentage at the onset? Um, you know, and then I kind of have a follow up because it's it, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, what we do, I mean, I know different journal editors do things in a slightly different way. There's a there's an initial check by the the, the, the sort of editorial journal office as a, for various various issues. Um, and there's various things in place to deal with um, sort of plagiarism and various bits and bobs. So there's some initial checks going on, which I'm, you know, I won't give too much details on that, but there's some initial checks going on. Then the journals, will, then the, the manuscripts will come through to me so it's the editor stroke editorial team, sometimes members of the editorial board, depending on what it is, will, will do the initial check. So what I'm, I have a checklist, so I'm just fair to, to everybody. So I can, I can see everything about you as authors if I want to, or I can block it out, which I block it out. So when I get a manuscript, I have a manuscript ID and I have a title and a, a PDF. So I will open that PDF and read it. 
And the first question is, I'm looking at scope, is it within scope? And quite sometimes they're not uh, for various reasons. And I don't know, we get quite a lot of them out of scope, so they, they will be rejected. And we have a system in place now where that goes back in the pool. And if, if the, the manuscript's decent, you know, decent quality, it can be sent, the editorial team will probably send it to a different journal to go out. So I will look at that. If it's in scope, then I'll look at, I've got to check this in terms of uh, what I call you know, the basics. Um, and that's about the uh, quality of communication. Is it, you know, can I make, if I read it and can't make, can't understand it, then there's something wrong with it and it gets, it gets out, it doesn't go out to review. Um, looking at quality in general terms, in terms of rigor and various things. Uh, you know, has it got the basics? Has it got, has it got a, 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 a literary review that sort of sets the context? Um, have you have the authors told me what they're doing and why they're doing it in terms of the method? Um, are the results, you know, can I follow the results? Can I follow the analysis? Is it a nice discussion, you know, discussion and, and conclusion, all the basic bits. Now that sounds, sounds quite straightforward, but sometimes uh, manuscripts come in and those well, I had one the other day, there's no literature review, it's just, you know, started reporting what they're doing. So there's no context that's gone, that's gone back out with a suggestion if you can deal with this then we'll have another look at it, but you might want to send it to another journal. Uh, sort of, um, sometimes there's, there's not much in the way of conclusion, sometimes the method's confused, sometimes I just can't understand it, you know, sort of, um, and if I can't understand it, the reviewers are not going to be able to, to understand it. So there's quite a high, there's an editing job going on there and there's quite a high proportion of, of manuscripts don't go out to reviewers um, and that's partly because I think reviewers um, you know I, I get annoyed you know I get a bit upset if I get get a manuscript sent to me to review and you say yeah it looks like a good title you open it and it's complete nonsense really to be honest you know let's let's call a spade a spade it's complete nonsense um, and you're thinking why why did the editor send me this so I'm trying not to do that because I know I know everybody's very busy and asking a reviewer to do a review, it, it does take time. It does take a lot of effort uh, to do it properly. And you know, something that I I think has got some question marks too, then it shouldn't be going out to to review. Uh, sometimes I send things and I, I think they look okay, and the reviewers come back and say, well, you know, this this isn't very good. Uh, but I think that's you know that's that's going to happen. But that's more on the content. So I, you know, I I leave the the questions about the content there left to the to the reviewers largely. Uh, to look at and then I'll once they all come in I'll, I'll take a view on that. Um, so we have a high rejection rate um, early on in the uh, looking at the, the initial manuscripts. Um, I, I wish I mean we get a lot of manuscripts in a way I, I wish we got fewer manuscripts but better quality manuscripts. Um, I think some people are sending them in without reading the, the scope and and you know some so, Oh, the other thing I should say, when I've read the manuscript, then I'll look at the author details and there's, there's quite often, a, sometimes there's a letter with it, sometimes there's not. And it's surprising, you know, sometimes get a letter saying, I've, you know, uh, dear editor, I've, you know, I've, I've been working on this paper for two years and I'd love to be published in Energy in Buildings or something. I thought, well, you got the wrong journal. And it's quite clear you've got the wrong journal from the, from the content. So I think people are sometimes rushing around and probably a little bit not quite as precious as they should be in terms of submitting things. Um, so I, I do deal with that. Um, so I, I hope, hopefully most of the most of the the reviewers at BRI um, actually when they open the manuscript it it does make sense. It's got all the basic components there. Um, it's not to say there's a few, you know, there'll probably be a few typos and some of the language people are writing in the second language or third language, English is second or third language. There's probably, you know, things that can be improved, of course, uh, but that's, you know, that's, that's fine. I think reviewers understand that. Um, but it's, so that's, that's the first, that's the first sort of quality check, uh, really. So I'm trying not to waste people's time too much. Um, sometimes it happens, but, you know, that's, that's, that's part of the mix, really. Um, I don't. I don't always get it. Get it right. Um, and some things I've rejected, and they end up. I see them eventually published somewhere else. You think, well, okay, right. Perhaps I got it wrong. But <laughs> well, I'm, it's not I'm not a foolproof system. But I think it's 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 quite a good system actually in terms of that. Um, There's some questions coming in on text chat on Stephen. I'm not sure if you can see them. That's a, yeah. that was a that was a great answer. Thank you so much. That was really nice. Um, a, on the the maximum length of a paper? 
Yeah, it's, we we set um, it's not really page length because it depends what sort of diagrams and, and things are in, in with it, but it's we aim at around about 8,000 words, but sometimes a longer if it's a literary review or it's a case study and there's quite a bit of, uh, of data that needs to be in there to make sense of it. It can be a bit longer. Uh, we like, you know, it'd be really nice if, if articles were about 5,000 words long, that'd be fantastic because it gives us a bit more space to publish a bit more each year. Um, but we tend to find they're a little bit longer than that, just in terms of, I think, the, the nature of BRI with the, this interdisciplinary nature of what we, we do. Quite often the, the, the articles end up a little bit longer because you, you some of the contextual issues you're dealing with do take a bit more space to, to explain. So around about 8,000, I, I take quite a relaxed view of that. Uh, sometimes manuscripts come in a bit, bit too long and some sometimes I'll send them back to the authors at the initial stage and say, you know, you need to need to make this bit, bit, a bit more concise. Sometimes I'll send it out to review and then it might get edited down with the, you know, in that, in that process of review. Uh, manuscripts, sometimes it's one revision, sometimes it's a couple, sometimes even three, just with sort of trying to, you know, just make it as, as, as good as we, as good as we can. And I think some authors get a bit fed up with me being a bit pedantic, but they, you know, it's sort of it's it's important because it's uh, we're looking for, you know, we do want high quality articles at the at the end of that. Um, and then there's some editing done, obviously, when it goes through to production. There's a there's another layer of editing and things going on there. Um, how do you deal with? I have no idea what this means. Type one and type two errors when you receive manuscripts. I don't know what a type one and type two error is actually, but I don't know. Perhaps we could explain what that is. Does anybody know what that is? <laughs> yeah, maybe Mose could, could explain that. Um, yeah. I've, I've heard of them, but <laughs> I've tried to, yeah. I can't um, pull that from my, from my yeah. brain. Um, yeah. I mean, there's, you know, there's the, as I went through, there's, a, there's obvious errors, you know, like there's no, there's no discussion or the conclusion is a summary of the paper, it's not a conclusion. I mean, there's things like that. Um, there's probably some smaller errors that get, sometimes they get picked up by the reviewers. Um, sometimes they get picked up by me. Um, sometimes they get picked up by the editorial um, uh, uh, people. Um, ah, false positive and false negative. Well, that's really, the, that's the reviewers trying to pick that up, um, ideally. Hopefully we've got reviewers who, who, can, who, who can see that, yeah. Uh, there's a question. Ah, that's a good question. I think Michael's going to ask me that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How do you match uh, reviewers with a manuscript? Right, that's a good question. Um, well, I, when I do my initial read, I use a, I've usually got a pad and paper here and I sort of write down a few what I think are the, are the main themes in that um, so that I can link it through to reviewers. There is a system in place at Taylor and Francis that um, once I go to select reviewers, um, there's an auto suggest that comes up with people who um, Taylor and Francis have a massive database and they'll suggest potential reviewers. And like everything with software, it's quite fallible, it's, it's, it's not perfect. So I get all sorts of weird and wonderful names and people have published on all sorts of things that have got nothing to do with the, the paper I'm doing. And then occasionally there's a few people who are appear to be relevant, so I might invite those. Um, then there's the keyword search. So if you're writing on, uh, I don't know, let's say innovation, I'll put innovation in and probably a few words around that to see what comes up. And that will uh, highlight uh, people who've written on innovation in BRI in the past. Um, and it will also do the search uh, within the Taylor and Francis journals as well. Sometimes I know of people, I know people who are working in the field who are not necessarily, they might not be in the database, so I sometimes invite those to, uh, to review. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, but that's, that's another way. So it's a bit of a mix really, so it's a bit of keywords. I mean, the, the authors put in their keywords and sometimes they're fine, sometimes I read them, I think, well, I wouldn't have used those keywords and I, I, do, my own, I do my own search on, on there. So I, there's quite a few functions available to me in the in the system. Sometimes you've cited, you know, if, you, if you're writing on um, 
I don't know, so I'll stick with innovation just for it's the first thing that came to my head. Um, if we stick with innovation, yeah, I, I know sort of the main, I've, I've sort of, when my PhD was based around that area, I know people who work in that area. So there's there's names that come to come to mind when I'm reading something on that anyway. You would expect some of those to be cited in the, in the references. Some of those people, if they're still active and have been publishing recently, then you know, I might well invite them to, to do the review. The other thing I should say, I try not to, we try not to put too much pressure on reviewers. So if you submit a manuscript, ideally I'd like, it would be nice if you reviewed one or two uh, manuscripts a year. Sometimes I ask, I might ask three times because I've got a bit stuck and I need, <laughs> well, there's somebody I really know is really good at that particular area. That's somebody, you know, absolutely ideal for that particular manuscript. Um, and we, we, um, we do try and spread it around a bit. So we've got new uh, early career researchers coming in. Sometimes I'll invite them to um, have, a, have a go at reviewing. Um, and that's when I've got more, more senior, uh, more experienced reviewers coming in as well. And sometimes I get an email from the academic uh, saying, I've only just got my PhD, I'm not sure I'm ready to review. And I said, well, please give it a go. And I sometimes give feedback on saying, actually, your, your review was, you know, it's in line, in line with what the more experienced reviewers have, have said as well. So sometimes I do that just to help, help people get into the reviewing and understand a bit more about the journal. Um, but I've always got in the back of my mind, you know, they are, they are sort of early career people and up and coming. So I, I do sort of, you do have to have a little bit of a balance with that. So they've, all the reviewers, so you're really trying to get um, experienced experienced people who know the field but um you're trying to trying to bring people along as as, as well on that um and if the review comes in and it's you know it's not very good it's it's a yes it's a good paper and that's the end of that you know obviously i don't send that on that sort of a i can reject that and then uh, ask send out again for some other reviewers um and sometimes it does take a little while to get the you know to get sort of good critical reviews in and sometimes i have to go out a couple of times to reviewers to do it so that takes a little bit of time time on that so it's a bit of a you know it's there's no no quick answer to that question but you're trying to match the reviewers to the menu manuscript um and sometimes uh, uh, reviewers come back and say i'm sorry i haven't got time to do this but there's a couple of people working in this field you might want to try try them most often they're already in the system anyway sometimes they're not so we add we add those in as a, and so the, the database of reviewers is, is expanding all the time, actually. Um, there's a few people, obviously there's people stopping because they're retiring or, or whatever, but there's, there's the database is, is expanding. It has expanded a lot over the last two years. We've brought in uh, sort of new reviewers. So we're trying to keep that as fresh as, as we possibly can. Um, so that was that one. Yeah, there's uh, there's two more questions in there. I mean, and you talked about early career researchers a little yeah. bit in that response. But I think uh, Barry and um, and Mose had some yeah. questions. If there's any yeah. specific advice, yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, we try to. I've I've worked I work quite closely with a few um, people come in. I, I I mean, what we try and do if we think a paper's got potential, but it's was something not not particularly good with it or not sort of is not really ready to go out to review. Um, sometimes we'll reject it and that's it with some some recommendations. Sometimes I'll go back and say if you can address these issues, we'll have a look at it again. Um, now I I don't know, I quite often don't know whether you're an early career researcher or whether you're established unless I spend some time checking you out. Um, so you might you might well be a professor, but I don't know. But if you, you might be an early career researcher. Um, so we, we try and give some advice on that. And sometimes, as a you know, everything's sort of done in the system. Occasionally, I get an email sort of outside of the the, the Taylor and Fancy system saying, you know, we're, we're not sure about this. Could you give us a little bit of help? Um, not everybody has. I'm aware that not everybody's got you know a lot of support in their their academic uh, 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 institution. Um, so we do we do try a bit with that. I've worked with a, a couple of people um, quite a bit to, to develop um, their papers. Uh, one got through, one didn't, but the other one, the one that didn't get through our reviewers in the end, despite me spending quite a bit of time on it, did end up getting published somewhere else. So I think that was, um, I was sort of pleased, pleased with that. Um, and I hope that particular individual I uh, got a very nice email saying thanks for your help and uh, sorry it didn't work out. Um, I hope, hope that individuals learned quite a bit from that. 
that experience. So we do try and try and help out where we where we can. And things like the how to get how to get published, how not to get published workshop, I think is quite useful in in you know identifying some of those obvious obvious things you need to look out for. So I'm happy to to do that with you. If in doubt, send me an email or a draft of a paper. If you think it's you know if you're not sure about it, let let me know. I'm quite happy to give some comments on that. Um, Early career is start writing and publishing articles. Well, I think I say to my PhD students, I mean, the more you read of articles published in the best journals and the top journals, the you get a feel for the style, you get a feel for the quality of what's what's required, um, and that's what you should be aiming for and aiming to do it to do it better. So I, I say to my PhD students, if you read a if you read an article and you don't like it or there's something wrong with it, why? <laughs> Ask yourself the question why. And can you avoid some of those pitfalls? And if you read a, an article you think is absolutely fantastic, again, the same question, why do you think it's absolutely fantastic? And can, can you know, you should, that's what you should be aiming for. Um, so that's really what we're, so you, you can do some quite, quite useful things on that. Um, I mean, most of the subjects, BR and I, like all the major journals, they've got quite a, quite a history of papers in there. So if you're working on a particular area, whatever it happens to be, there's probably a chance that there's been one, two, 20, 100 <laughs> articles published on that area before. Uh, so you can get a bit of a feel in terms of the quality and what's expected and what people have published in the past. Um, the only thing I will say, the quality is, is changing. I hope it's going up, but it, you know, that's, that's for people to take their own view on that, but hopefully it's sort of, it's going up. Um, and things change a little bit. So we've we've clamped down a lot more recently on the publishing ethics on people citing their own work and citing their colleagues' work and various things. I mean, that's a bit of a problem in the in publishing, I think. So we've clamped down on that a bit. I've, I've upset a few people, I think, and just sort of saying we're not we're not publishing that because you, you're citing your work too much. But um, I think that's right and right and proper. So if you look back a few years in all the journals actually you'll see you know that's that's quite rife actually <laughs> um but all, all the all the publishers and journals are, are starting to address that now so that's being slowly but surely weeded out so just be a little bit careful on looking back too far because things the quality is i think is changing a bit um so common mistakes or well, some of the common mistakes made um i mean clarity of writing is it sounds strange, but clarity of writing is quite often a, a problem. If, you know, I, if I read something and I'm confused, I mean, I might not understand it because it's, it's not my area of research, but that doesn't, I, I'm not worried about that because reviewers will sort that out. But if I can't make sense of what you're telling me you've done, then, you know, that's, that's, the, that's actually quite a big, big uh, problem. And that's sometimes related to, to language and working in a second or third language. Um, it's sometimes I, I see it a lot. I mean, I do it. I'm guilty of it myself because you, you're so close to the subject area. Sometimes you you <laughs> you 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 know what you're talking about, but you've you've got to remember that the person reading the manuscript probably doesn't you know doesn't know what you what's in your head. You've got to put that in black and white. So some of those really basic things are sometimes missing in the in the journal. So um, I have that you know I have that challenge with my PhD students, and I know um, I'm, I'm sure. The people here who are su supervisors and even you know writing yourself it's sometimes difficult to to make it make it clear um so i submit journal i submit manuscripts to i don't su submit them to bri i submit them to other journals and sometimes it comes back and you you know you, you're sort of hitting your head and well of course yeah that's obvious i should have put that in and the, you haven't put it in because you're so close to it so there's things like that um not not sort of the conclusions, I think, generally are quite weak. Um, if, I, if I said the one thing that's weak, it's probably conclusions. And um, they are quite difficult to do, I think. They're very difficult to do. Um, so we do get quite a lot of conclusions that are a bit more of a summary of the paper rather than, than a conclusion and recommendations for, for further research. So that's one thing. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be rejected at the first hurdle. It's probably something the reviewers, I'll leave the reviewers to pick up on, on that. If the reviewers haven't and they th think the paper's okay to, to go forward, then I will I will probably put some comments on there about the about the uh, conclusion and and give us some advice on what we expect to see. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, 
it's difficult to say what are the mistakes. I mean, it's the um, errors, really, that's the reviewers picking up any errors. It's, it's sort of technical, what I call a bit more technical issues um, on things that they've, you know, somebody's got something wrong and sometimes it's, it's a typo in a, in a, there's a decimal point in the wrong place or something. I mean, some, some, sometimes it's as simple as that. Sometimes it's a bit more fundamental um, issues in terms of what's being done. Uh, so hopefully that answers that a little bit. Um, the other comment is, oh yeah, this is a good one. How do you handle opposing comments from reviewers? That's a very good question. <laughs> um, I go through, we go through a spell where the, you find that the reviewers are saying pretty similar comments actually. So we, we try and get three reviews for every paper. Sometimes there's four or five. Uh, sometimes there's two if I'm really stuck and, but they're very similar and, you know, and I, I know the area well enough then we can probably go with two, but it's usually three or four uh, if we, we try and make a decision on things. Um, and you find that reviewers, you know, from different parts of the world, slightly different subject areas, probably sometimes to get a balance, are coming up with very similar comments. So that's always quite reassuring. Sometimes we get a, uh, reviews where, you know, this is the, the best thing I've ever seen. So this is the worst thing I've ever seen. Um, and something in the middle. So, so what I, I mean, I, I read all the reviews and take a, make a decision on that. If I, if, if I'm leaning towards the, this isn't very good, then it will probably be rejected. If I'm leaning towards, I think this is quite good. Um, I'll go out for another review. Um, the editorial board have, I mean, a, quite a do quite a bit in terms of promoting the, the journal. They also help me out with sort of second, third, fourth opinions on, on things when we need it. Uh, because some sometimes it's my, you know, I know enough about the area to make a decision. Sometimes I don't. There's some some areas we publish in the journal not that that well up on. Um, so I, you know, it's not fair to me to make a comment. So we'll we'll go through to the editorial board or another reviewer I know sort of you know has a has a good view on this um yeah it's it's, it's difficult um it's it's a, a difficult area I don't know what was what you're just trying to be fair to the the author on on this as best you can be um sometimes I send the comments to you know back to the authors and they come back saying yes okay understood it's yeah fair comments Sometimes they come back and say, well, I, you know, I think your reviewers don't know what they're doing sort of thing, but uh, that's, um, I'm pleased to say it's quite rare, but it's, it does happen occasionally. Um, but, you know, then go to another journal and, I'm, you know, you might get some different comments on, on that. So, I mean, I've had, I've had that as well. I've had, I've, you do experience that sometimes. Um, I don't know what the real answer is, it is other than trying to get some, you know, some good, good reviews and trying to be fair to people uh, as best you can. And then we have to make a decision and sometimes benefit of hindsight that probably wasn't the right decision to, to, to do to take it forward and sometimes it's the decision to reject it probably wasn't the right decision and it, you see it in another journal and think oh you know <laughs> perhaps we should have gone with that one <laughs> it looks really good um, but yeah that's that's part of the trying to get published uh, um, scenario I'm sure a lot of you have been in that sort of sort of situation um, in the past um, so we do what we can to be, you know, to be fair and, and transparent on these things, but um, sometimes we don't always get the decision right. Um, I think that's fair to say. Have to be humble about that. Um, yeah. uh, yeah, and I, I think, oh, sorry, I will just say, as a reviewer submits several negative comments, I mean, you've got the, you do have the option to, to sort of respond and say, well, we've, we, we don't think the reviewers are right because of the following reasons. Um, and that, that quite often happens. Um, and that sort of usually ends up with a bit of a, um, sometimes reviewers say, okay, fine, yeah, I understand. Sometimes there's still a bit of disagreement and then I have to make a decision a bit, but perhaps at the first revision or something stage um, on that. Um, I think reviewers sometimes can get a bit pedantic about things. So I have to take a more, global view about things say well actually you know you're getting getting a bit pedantic about a very small issue and it you know generally speaking you know, the overall overall um uh, overall paper is fine you know it's sort of and um, that's an opinion rather than a than a than a, than a factual issue really so um I'll, I'll sometimes take a view on that so i sort of will intervene um on that as well uh, but you got the chance to you know, say the reviewers are, are wrong and this is why they're wrong. So that's that's fine. That's all part of the, the mix as well. 
And that's as an editor, I'm sure other editors here, it's, it's quite nice to see that sometimes to see a robust defense of your, of your work. Um, right. Anything else? Any, any more questions for Stephen? Stephen, I thought you gave some great advice for early career researchers as well. Thank you for, for that and our, our students in the audience. Um, do, um, just going along with, you know, getting early career researchers and students involved in uh, reviews, do, do you provide reviewer feedback back to the reviewers? So in other words, do they see the other reviewers comments after you've made a decision? We we don't at the moment on on the Taylor and Francis platform. Um, it's something we're looking something we're looking at. I know some journals do. Um, you can go into your reviewer account and see what the overall decision decision was. Um, I've, I've yeah, I think there's pros and cons on on that really in terms of. I think sometimes it's helpful, sometimes it's 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 less so. Um, I think that's probably something that will change in the in the future. I don't know. It's it's, it's certainly a discussion we're having with the with the publisher at the moment. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see the the pros and the cons. Yeah, yeah. From yeah. from from your side of things, um, it's sometimes nice to see. Yeah. When, yeah. When, you know, in or or you see a really you know you you reviewed a paper, and you see you read another review and you and you think. Wow, I was, I'm really impressed with the way you know reviewer number four really did that thorough review, and then you kind of maybe look mm -hmm. internally to yourself and say, "Well, I I didn't review the paper well enough," <laughs> and so yeah. you kind of <laughs> so so you learn some things sometimes yeah. by yeah. seeing those other comments, and then other other times it's interesting when the reviewers are saying all the same things. Yeah. Um, yeah well too yeah. so there's some there's some learning opportunities and yeah no, that's true that's true yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so that's something that it's on the you know it's on the it's it's in there as, as there's things we we're always looking at the journal in terms of what we can do better um so that's that's one of the things that's in the mix at the moment with a few other other things looking at that um yeah well, this is, uh, there's maybe one more comment coming in. Maybe this is the last question we could take. I know we're coming to the top of the hour and I want to respect your time, Stephen. And uh, that's okay. I, uh, one last uh, by uh, Bilal. Right. Well, that's a very good, uh, Bilal. Yeah. Very good question. Um, I try to, um, I try and be, uh, try, try and treat everybody's uh, comments equal weight. Um, I say if I if I have invited an early career researcher to to review, then I I do take a slightly different view of that. Um, but quite often they do a really good job, so I, it's it's okay. Um, um, yeah, I think if if there's something I'm a bit concerned about from a reviewer, um, it doesn't happen very often, but you know occasionally you think I'm not sure whether this reviewer has really really read the paper in a lot of detail <laughs> um, might have done it in a bit of a hurry or something or just got the wrong line of the stick then I've I've there's two well I'll I'll send out for another review uh, or another one or two reviews um, and I'm I might I might send that on to the author I might sort of redact it and not send it it depends on what it is it's very rare for me to redact things occasionally I've just uh, you'll see there might be a comment in square brackets saying some comments taken out if they're a bit I think they're not really appropriate to you know there's a bit of an opinion which is a bit sort of off <laughs> off topic or something I might sort of just edit that out um, but I put a note in when I have done that because you, you you know it's not my comments it's the reviewers comments on that just to be just to be fair um, but no I don't I don't weigh the reviewers comments uh, in terms of experience I think the what we're doing in terms of the reviewers we, we invite, you know, I'm I'm pretty confident that they've got the right experience to review those review those papers. Um, and you're never quite sure what you're going to get back, of course, um, as to how detailed or otherwise it, it may be. But that's a slightly different thing to to waiting. Uh, so no, I, I I don't. I mean, I think as authors, probably you you know, I know when I get comments back, some you might take a bit more to heart than others, and uh, you might sort of you know um, so. Um, and you're never quite, you know, you're never quite sure how authors are going to re respond. Um, I mean, I've been doing this job seven years now as ADM editor for five years and this for two years. And I think I've had a handful of people complained about the reviewers comments. And a couple of times they've got, you know, people have got a little bit upset about 
what reviewers have said, but it's it's quite rare for that. And some and most of those cases, people have misinterpreted what's been said. And that's uh, you know this this wonderful thing about language. I mean, words mean different things to different people in different countries and different societies and different cultures. Um, and it's it. I, I try and keep an eye on this. Just to, uh, there's a few words I I know that they're okay to me, but I know people in other countries don't like <laughs> certain words being used. So I I do just keep a, an eye out for that to to not up, to hopefully we're not upsetting people with the with the comments. Uh, but it's it's pretty rare really. But I know that's a slightly different slightly different issue to what you what you've asked. Um, but certainly for our journal, I I treat everybody every reviewer is treated the same um, with the with this exception of early career researchers that are put in as you know the fourth or fourth or fifth reviews quite often on that just to help bring them bring them along um but as i said before that's usually pretty good anyway so um that's a, they do a do a good job on it um okay uh, I suppose I should say I'm not sure all editors will answer like this. I'm not sure, but I hope they will. But <laughs> there's a sort of a, there might be one or two slightly. Some editors might do things in a slightly different, slightly different way to to we do at BRI, of course. And that's you know that's part of makes the world interesting. It makes the uh, gives a bit of colour to to things. Um, Maybe we need a workshop on how to become a better reviewer. <laughs> as well yeah well yeah, that's interesting possibly, yeah. yeah yeah um there's there's some there's some guidance there's some guidance on the the publishers have uh, uh guidance and there's some there are some if you look on the web there's there's guidance on that um i do occasionally get an email from people saying i'm not quite sure whether you know is it appropriate to to say this or not um so that's if you if you're a bit unsure please please ask me um, I mean, generally, most my, my experience is, you know, it's very positive. Um, you get you get a few, you do get a few that obviously been done in a hurry for whatever reason, and they're not really much value to me or to or to authors really. Um, but generally speaking, people do do a, you know, do do a good good job. Um, and I think as an editor, it's interesting seeing what you know, even if the reviews are quite similar in their comments, it's interesting seeing what people pick out. Um, and you know, a different pair of eyes see different things, or and read different things, interpret different things. So that's I, th I think it's a I always find it an interesting, interesting experience looking at reviewers, reviewers' comments. Uh, but yeah, I think it it wouldn't hurt to have a have some tr some training on that to be you know to be better better reviewers. Um, it's probably a good thing to do. Um, that's probably that's, again, it's probably a workshop I could do. There's probably uh whether the publishers could do that actually that's a good good point um yeah but there is quite a bit of guidance out there but as you know reading reading guidance is a little bit different to actually doing it and <laughs> people talking about it as well so yeah i think the dialogue such as we've had for the last 60 minutes you know it's just been so rich and um incredible for our audience i think for a researcher at any stage to hear the comments that you're, you know, this the thoughts that you have, the comments that you're um, making. It's just highly valuable. So, very, mm -hmm. very rich. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Yep. Yep. Well, hi, Silvio. Long time no see. <laughs> well, it's the top of the hour, Stephen. I really want to thank yep. you. This has been an absolutely great great inaugural Meet the Editor series. Uh, like I said, this has been a very rich session. It is recorded, so we'll we'll yep. get this up onto our website here probably in 24 to 48 hours. And um, again, thank you. Thank you so much. Yep. And I hope that some of our commissions and our early career researchers and students may follow up with you. Um, yes, that would, you know, that would be. To, to, you know, maybe offer their services as a reviewer as well and some of their expertise so yeah that would be good yeah we're always looking for for reviewers so no problem with that thank you and uh, thank you for the kind comments um, i mean it's there to hopefully it, it's it's helped a little bit and like i say if any any questions or anything is please please do get in touch and i'll get i will get back to you okay thank you so thank much everyone have a great thank day you thank you, yeah okay thank you okay bye bye